So if you'll allow me, okay, thank you. You're allowed, we can start. Okay, thank you, Alison. Good morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Minji Mei. I'm the uh, traffic engineer for the city of Santee. And uh, here in place for the chair, Jim, who is not available today. So welcome to the October 15, 2020 Santec meeting. And uh, first, I like was we'll do introduction, right? Uh, Alice, you're gonna call the roll, right? One by one? We will do roll call while we approve minutes, Chair, Vice Chair. Okay. So then we jump to the item number two, approval of meeting minutes from the last meeting. Uh, please take a couple minutes and take a quick look at the meeting minutes and uh, we'll, we'll see if somebody will take, uh, we'll make a motion or we'll go from there. Thank you. I make a motion for the approval of the minutes. This is Hamid. I have a motion. Any second I second the motion. Okay. Sam Hassan and City Vista. Okay. We have a motion and a second. I think now we'll take a roll call, right? Allison for approval. That's correct. I'll have uh, my colleague Eva uh, take roll call and record minutes. Uh, minutes approval. Hi everyone. Um, I will take approval of meeting minutes based on confirmed attendance and we'll go in alphabetical order. Um, I apologize if I missed anyone in, in advance. City of Chula Vista. Oliver Bauer, City of Chula Vista, aye. City of El Cajon. <clears throat> Mario Sanchez, City of El Cajon, I approve the minutes. City of Escondido. We have the Gokarwatsa line in with the City of Escondido, approve of the minutes. Thank you. City of Imperial Beach. Jason Stack and approve the minutes. Thank you. City of La Mesa. Um, Mike Kennard, uh, approve the minutes. Thank you. City of Lemon Grove. I, I don't believe they're here um, at the moment. City of Oceanside. Uh, this is Hamid and vote to approve the minutes. Thank you. Uh, city of... San Diego. This is Maureen Gardner, City of San Diego, approve. Eva, can we go back to City of Poway, who's in attendance? Yeah. City of Poway. Melody Rocco, I approve. Thank you. City of Santee. Minji here, I approve. Thank you. And City of Vista, Sam, you seconded the motion. Yes, correct. Um, thank you. County of San Diego. I am uh, Subir Wada, and I approve. Thank you. I believe that was everyone. Did I miss anyone or any jurisdiction? We have the City of Encinitas with us now. All right. Um, city of Encinitas. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Was that everyone? Uh, that is every that is everyone to date. Um, and we will close voting and roll call, although we will record anyone attending the meeting after uh, uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the Meeting minutes was approved. Thank you, Ava and uh, Allison. So move on to item number three, public comments. Is there anybody from the public want to address the committee? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item. Uh, before we do that, uh, maybe a little housekeeping item. Uh, maybe I'll suggest that uh, um, 
uh, if you want to speak, please either raise your hand or turn on your camera. Maybe if you raise, if you raise your hand but nobody notices you, you can you can turn on the camera and then maybe wave. So hopefully that will see you that that way. Yeah, please do turn off your camera if you you don't uh, plan to speak at this moment. So item number four is a report on the development of regional smart intersection and the next OS concept of operations report by consultant and the Sandex staff. Please go ahead, Alex. So let me just uh, give some uh, introductory uh, remarks before I turn it over to Alyssa, son uh, of uh, Kim Lee Horn um, on this discussion. This is really a follow-up to the previous discussion that we had last week, uh, sorry, last month. But we're also introducing uh, a new concept the, um, in terms of the level of effort that we're undertaking. But from a very high level, to, just to provide context, a lot of you, uh, at least in this working group, are familiar with concepts uh, of operations report. And, and, you, and, and you might uh, already be aware that really this report is, is a document that tries to address uh, kind of the user oriented um, needs for any systems, ITS type of systems. And, and the idea here is that for today's discussions, we're going to be introducing, uh, well, one of them was introduced at the last uh, Santec meeting, which is a smart intersection system that we're trying to undertake. And the next one is the next operating system, which is a key component of our regional plan vision. But anyway, besides the key elements that are included in those CONOPs, like the objectives or, or description of an existing system, these reports are also trying to obtain input and feedback uh, of key user needs um, on, on these systems, which are really intended to fulfill or provide a roadmap for a transformation from sort of today's, how our systems are being used from a functionality perspective, but also what we envision in the future, uh, really to provide a safer or more efficient or connected environment. So what you will hear today is a, a discussion from Melissa, kind of give you some additional context in how these systems um, from would, uh, are part of the larger uh, context in the region, but also really uh, initiate the discussion and engagement from all of you guys, a little bit more detail on, on providing and reaching out to get some feedback on possible user needs that'll help us define the functionalities. And just to give you some additional background, we are doing these um, uh, sort of uh, we reaching out by way of several meetings. So we've been talking and started talking to the CMCP teams. We are going to the social services transportation working group, and we're also trying to get some freight stakeholders. But these are just as examples of other working groups that we are reaching to get this level of feedback. But with that, uh, we're just starting this process. Um, and then um, I'll turn it over to Alyssa, and she could also talk about the next steps. Alyssa? Great. Right. Thank you, Alex. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so we last spoke at our meeting about the uh, what TISMO is and what the, the TISMO plan is. Um, as Alex mentioned, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the details today to talk about the smart intersection and the next OS concept of operations. As we talked about last time, the concept of operations talks, uh, it's a high level document explaining how these systems will operate, who the users are, and how they'll be using the system. In order to do that, we need to identify what the needs are. They're the foundation of the concept of operations, and the needs will be traceable throughout that systems engineering V that I talked to last time. Now, we talked last time about some of your needs. I know, Zabir, you mentioned making sure that we uh, understand the needs of rural communities and the importance of safety and what that means for a, a rural community might be different for a more urban community. And that's the type of information that we want from you guys. We are going to be sending out a survey. Um, it's going to look a little bit like this. Where this is one of ultimately where we'll get to, where we'll have a list of the needs and we'll put them into these buckets right here. You're showing goals. Um, we've already started on that list. We've talked to the 78 stakeholders that I mentioned last time. We've looked at policy documents, obviously from our understanding of the region. So we have a list that we're starting with we're going to ask you whether you agree or disagree and if there's anything else that you want to add. That's going to be coming out as a survey. As Alex mentioned, we are providing this survey to other stakeholder groups, including the CMCPs, active transportation, social services. So some of you might get the survey in more than one context. You can just fill out the survey one time based on your, your viewpoint of your agency. Or if you feel comfortable, you can also fill it out more than one time if you think 
your viewpoint in the context of your CMCP is different from your overall agency viewpoint, that's totally fine. We'll take more than one survey, just make a note which view you're using. Um, and that's to identify the needs. We are identifying the needs as we work to complete this concept of operations for the five big moves, specifically the next OS, the next operating system, and the smart intersection. I'm going to touch a little bit on what these five big moves are. I'm sure you've heard about them before. Um, you know, they're listed individually as five big moves, but really the thing that makes them big is their interrelationship. Individually, I would say they're not as big, but they are all interrelated and their impacts are biggest when they are working together. Now, some of them are obvious, for instance, you know, transit leap, how it relates to mobility, pubs and flexible fleets. That's really how you improve transit operations from one end of the trip to the other. So that, that makes sense how those work together. We're gonna to talk a little bit more about the complete corridors and how those are interrelated. The next OS, it's shown as part of this circle, but it's really, I think, the brains of all of them. It's, it, it impacts not only all of the big moves, it impacts uh, planners, or you can potentially use the next operating system for planners to do data analysis to understand where the challenges are and what the next projects will be. Transportation operators will use the next OS to identify performance metrics and do part of that, that TISMO that we talked about last time, the ongoing operational improvements by using the next OS to identify where those improvements need to be. And then residents or businesses, just the individual, will use it as a traveler information. It can also be used for payment um, for services, whether that's for the flexible fleets or, or other, other modes as well. So the next OS really is the foundation uh, that brings all of the five big moves together. When we look at the next OS, we're going to be looking at a variety of use cases. Some of them are shown here, um, and some of them we'll be identifying through this process that I talked about where we're identifying what the needs are. Um, we're, we're gonna, we talked about the smart intersection last time. We're going to be talking about that more. Certainly mobility as a service and curb management will be part of our discussion in terms of the smart intersection. But we're looking to you to really understand what these use cases are and what the applications need to be for the next OS. Now, as we're talking about the next OS, there are so many different components to it. As I mentioned, the planning, the operations, the users, I think, a lot of our discussion today will be focused on the, the mobility and the analytics of it, and then also on the operational piece. The other concept of operations we're going to be working on is that smart intersection that we talked about, the smart intersection toolbox. And what are the tools in that toolbox we need to, to identify? What are the strategies? And we've listed a couple here. I'm gonna come back to this slide as we're getting into the details, but I just wanna talk about it in general first. The, the smart intersection is applying your needs at a local level. And what are those things that we need to do locally to improve operations? Whether it's looking at safety, for instance, um, we might need to treat, look at safety improvements for active transportation modes. That might be something that you're currently um, could use improvement on. And we'll talk about what those strategies are that we can do for that. It could be the, the real-time performance monitoring, which obviously relates to the next OS as well, when we're looking at what those data sources have to be that to help you do your job better. And then we're also going to be looking, as these concept of operations are, are tools that you will be able to use in the next several years, but we also want to look a little bit out there. What are the, the, the technologies that are emerging that could help us improve operations? And some of those connected technologies are actually here, but maybe are not implemented throughout the, throughout the region. Um, and there are more capabilities, certainly, that we're going to be discussing along the way. I don't know if anyone has seen this uh, image exactly. This is uh, available on this internet link that you can see here. This is the, uh, the public facing data viewer that has been put together for the five big moves. It's been um, presented to the, the TC and the board, Sandag. It's, um, you could go back and look at those, those um, presentations to learn more about it specifically. But this shows exactly what all of the planned improvements are for the, the five big moves. We're going to drill down right now on a, on, a, on a specific example. But as we talk through this specific example, I wanna be clear that 
it's just for, for discussions purposes. When we're doing our concept of operations, we are really looking at the whole region and we want them to have tools in that toolbox for the whole region. Um, you know, you're welcome to go on your own and look at your specific agency's um, layers and see where, what is planned for you if, if you're not in those discussions right now. But for right now, we're looking at the, the Mission Valley. Now, all of you obviously aren't directly involved in Mission Valley. Um, it is certainly an important corridor in the region, but if you were to move these needs to where your intersections are, that's what we're looking at right here. Now, the purple is the, the kind of the area of influence. And you can see from this previous map, there are a lot of purple, especially in this example, that, this location that we're looking at right now. And each of the layers that we've called out here is a, a, specific, um, a specific improvement. What we want to understand right now is what are the improvements that would help you implement these, um, these things? For example, as we're looking here, we have the, um, there's an urban corridor managed lane, managed lanes. Now, I want this to be interactive, so I, I would love for some input on when you think of managed lanes, what is it that we can do to help you to deploy a managed lane? And when we're looking at the intersection right here, assume that we're looking here like at on Friars Road somewhere. At the intersection level, what is the data that you would need to operate your system if you have a managed lane? All right, I'm going to throw out some things and see what your, what this, your thoughts are. Is this, was that a question waiting for an answer? That's a question waiting for an answer. Well, this is Hamid Bahadur, Oceanside. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I imagine that for uh, conversion to a managed lane, um, you want to consider the overall corridor carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. And uh, managed lanes can be very effective in carrying large volumes in a relatively short time. Um, during the peak hour, uh, while uh, they may be harmful during the non-peak. Uh, so in the managed lanes, we got to be careful to use them more effectively and uh, maybe have them on a part-time basis when there is a need and they carry, they pump large volumes uh, much um, more than a normal a general purpose lane. Uh, but then during the off-peak, uh, the managed lanes, assuming that they are told paid lanes, uh, may not be utilized effectively. So we may want to give a kind of a tiered pricing or even a pricing during the congestion, non-pricing during non-peak non-congestion. Uh, so to maximize their use, uh, uh, full-time congestion, uh, full-time managed lanes, uh, um, say, for example, if you have a peak, and I'm just throwing numbers for the sake of argument, if you have a peak from, say, 6 to 9 in the morning, and mm -hmm. then the corridor goes back to, like, acceptable level of service, say, from 9 until 3, uh, then uh, people are looking at these managed lanes and nobody's there between 9 and 3, and they say, why can't I get there? And they don't want to pay that high price that we charge during the peak. So the, the dynamic pricing or a zero pricing for certain hours at night time, say after eight or nine at night or things like that, makes them uh, more appealing, uh, at least from public perception and makes them more effective uh, from transportation planning perspective. So the type of information that I for one would be looking is that like what are the corridor overall carrying capacity and when do I really need managed lanes during what period of time and what are my options for using them and not having them empty sitting out there during the non-peak. So just, just a few thoughts. Oh, that's great. I, from what, what I'm hearing you say is that there are some specific performance measures that we would need to be tracking. Uh, you mentioned the carrying capacity and level of service. Yeah, um, because I, I've, I've, I've some, some of these managed lanes that I've seen uh, actually the results and you know them in the area like 91 yeah. express lanes in Orange County yeah. and 10 and 110 in LA County that actually during the peak hours they, they carry a 
much higher volume uh, of cars uh, compared to a general purpose lane uh, because of their stabilized flow and the rather consistent uh, speed. Uh, so these are very effective. Um, so the kind of volume, the kind of information that I'll be looking at is that, okay, the managed lane, how much more cars, how many more people per se, considering my average vehicle ridership and all that, do I carry on a managed lane compared to a general purpose lane? And in the peak hour, in very congested corridor, it clearly shows that the managed lane is preferable and carries even more number of people. But then the balance is that how do we not kill and waste that real estate, that pavement area during the off peak uh, when I may have more need helping my general purpose lane, but then the managed lane is not available except to people who have a transponder or people who want to pay. Um, so there's, we need to do some kind of balancing to make sure we are not focusing only on the peak hour, but the overall 24 hour period. Right. I think that's an important key that the temporal aspect that is something that we need to measure and change our operations according to the use of the, the, the facility at that time, as you mentioned, peak and off peak, but there might be others. What do you think it means from um, uh, maybe a metering? Well, what what is we, you, you mean the metering by getting into them like a similar to a wrap meter or something like that? Right. If we're looking at what are your thoughts? thoughts collectively on um, what can we do at these interchanges or these intersections of facilities to improve operations? Is that ramp metering? Um, is that pro providing information between multiple jurisdictions so that you understand what's happening on the managed lane if you're, um, you know, a, a local agency that's impacting your arterials? I, for one, think that yes, yes to all the above, all what you mentioned. And, and I think, let me just expand on, I think, where Alyssa is going. And I think mm -hmm. you, know, you, you made some great points um, in terms of the managed lanes. And you really describes kind of the day-to-day -day operations, all these different elements, operational elements that we need to kind of, and to me, what you described, it's sort of the next OS uh, possible user needs from the managed lanes perspective. And, and then Alyssa, try to dig into, okay, so what does that mean from, for example, just using this Friar Road, the idea is that you might have some on-ramps associated with an operational com component of the managed lanes concept. But what would that mean to the local agencies? Um, so you describe kind of day-to-day -day operations, but another scenario could be during major incidents. What would that mean from a local agency perspective? What would your needs be? Um, and then we would flesh that out either as an intersection, smart intersection user need, um, but also at the next OS user need. So th this, that's a great example. Um, I mean, and then you went through kind of the larger context. Um, and then there's other components in this exhibit here showing, for example, there's a planned uh, uh, next generation rapid. Right. What would that need be associated with making sure that there's that we address those needs from your local agency perspective? Um, and, and this is the type of discussion that, you know, we'll try to flush out in, in, in more detailed surveys. But anyway, I just wanted to expand on what's happening in this discussion now. And that's what we're really trying to capture. Put, you, put yourselves in the shoes of, of the user need or the user that will be using that facility. Does anyone have any questions or comments on that route? I'm particularly curious um, around here where we have the, the next gen rapid, where it meets kind of just a, a, a typical regional arterial. This is on Friars. What, what does that look like, that intersection of the next gen rapid and the arterial management? What is the information that we're looking at here? And what are the strategies that we could do um, for transit operations or for uh, pedestrian safety, uh, for arterial operations in terms of signal timing? What are some of the, the strategies that y'all can think of um, for that, the, the case where the transit is operating on some of the arterials? You have a, a lot of different users and certainly the, the concept of a next-gen rapid is to um, improve 
transit uh, utilization through improved performance and improved service. So how do we get that? Yeah, and this, is, yeah, yeah, this, mm -hmm. this is I mean, just a few thoughts uh, at these kinds of mobility hubs and when these different modes come together, the interconnectability, the ease and safety of interconnectability is in my mind, the most critical. These are places where people change modes and they may be driving to this point and they may be parking and getting off. They want to get to a transit center. Mm -hmm. They may be on a bike and they may come to a transit center. They may be getting off transit and using their bike to get uh, to home or workplace. So um, at these locations um, and information sharing, of course, is important. You know, if I'm in my car, and I'm trying to make it to the transit center. It's good if I have an app on my dashboard that tells me when is the next train coming? Do I have time? Do will I get there in time? And things like that. And these are relatively very simple stuff because next train is a common technology. It's just a matter of sharing it public so I can access it from my iPhone or my iPad. And then the, when I, where I park or where I get off the bike lane, how do I get to the platform to get into the train or the bus, rapid bus, whatever. So the two fundamental issues for me in areas like this, which for lack of better world, uh, I, I call them the transportation hubs. Uh, at these locations, interconnectability and safety is, is very important in my mind and information sharing. Anyone else have anything to share on that? I'm, I'm curious, particularly about the safety element. Now, obviously, we, we talk about how that's important. What can we do to improve safety when we do have those multiple modes coming together, as you mentioned, with the, the bicycle trying to, to make, the, um, make it on the, the bus? How, what, have what have you studied? What have you done that's successful? What can you think of that would be helpful? Have you looked at... Um, or would you be open to exploring something like a, an app that tracks a bicycle user as they're going through the intersection to help um, improve signal timing and signal operations for that bicyclist? Is that something that would be, uh, that could help the safety of the bicyclist or something that would improve operations for bicyclists? Is that something that y'all have looked into or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, this is Jabir. Uh, based on my experience with my agencies, I, I, I don't know, I mean, uh, what you're talking is it really is probably more of uh, uh, related to the, Hamid gave you all that uh, great information because he was involved in the urban setting of things yes. and the interconnectivity of modes of travel modes. So that mm -hmm. really is important and probably, you know, somebody from MTS probably should be the one that really say in their vision of what they see the transit and how, how a user transfers from one mode to the other mode. Mm -hmm. All I can tell you is that if, you, if I was in the agency and you give me something like this, unless you give us a long-term resources, it's probably going to be there for a while and it's probably going to be dormant for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just want to stress the issue of the resources of the public, of the local agency is so important in whatever vision we want to implement. Unless you do something that nobody is a need to be uh, maintaining it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's, you know, my point is really is the resources, no matter what we put on, on the ground, it needs resources to manage it and run it right. all the time. And with time, if the region or Sandia, Caltrain, MTS doesn't have any say in the budgeting of the staff. Then, you know, the local agency will just move people out and they will sit there, you know. So, so mm -hmm. I just want to put that on the table. And I know it's right. not a technical issue. It's more of a policy issue. But we need to, you know, it should be addressed if you want a long-term successful program. Right. But the how that, I mean, that's an important comment and I appreciate that. And you're not, you're speaking for a lot of people when you're worried about yes. the resources, but what that could do and translate into what we're looking at here is maybe a reliance on big data instead of infrastructure that has to be kept up. 
maybe there needs to be um, more active alerts when when these situations are happening so you don't have the time to dedicate to monitoring things uh, especially as Alex was talking about earlier when there's an incident you know you want to be alerted to that is happening um, yes. so as we're putting together yes. the concept of operations we'll be yes. um, sensitive to the fact that maintenance is not something you probably have a lot of time or budget for and operations is also something but that's really honestly why we're doing this and this can actually help improve operations without um, providing a considerable strain on your time or your yeah. resources yeah. because that's what this next os does it's a regional right. system that brings all of this together yeah and that's and what we're trying to understand what you need from it so that right. we could help you Oh, yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, I mean, um, I actually remember when I was on the uh, on the corridor analysis that we did for the I-15. To me, it's like, uh, okay, see, if I have the program, I have the app as the operator for, for that part, for a specific part of the uh, of the overall program. If I have it there in my computer, uh, in my computer or my phone, but I, but it becomes more a default. I only react if I see something I don't like. Yeah, but right. not by every time you send me an alert, I have to do something. Then you're gonna probably not gonna be. But mm -hmm. you send an alert just to tell me as an information, but only I see it and I say, wait a minute, ooh, there is something going on. I can't let you do that anymore. So you get a change to this uh, to system right. B, whatever it is. So that's mm -hmm. uh, that's to me is very important. And I, mm -hmm. you know, so that's yes, it reduces the effort of the uh, of the local resources uh, for uh, maintaining a proper program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. That's good feedback. Thank you. And one, one thing I may suggest, you know, is this is Hamid again, is just that um, not to try to guess what the system users may want, but yeah. simply ask them. And I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. to do an extensive survey. There are a lot mm -hmm. of research out there. Uh, people have done the research and asked, for example, the bicyclists, the pedestrians, mm -hmm. the, the people who switch between modes from car to train or bus mm -hmm. and vice versa. What is important to you? Uh, right. So ask them also, and uh, not to try to hypothesize as what we think is of right. value to them. Well, that's a good point. So let's maybe let's take a couple of minutes. Ellison, do we have a couple of minutes? You're fine. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Let's focus on the the signal operations, which is actually something that all of you are. Um, influence and have needs about um, and that plays into all of these things that you can see on this map here when we're talking about signal operations especially across corridors or with regional impact where they manage lanes and transit get together um, what can we do from a signal operations component now obviously you're aware of signal synchronization and that sort of thing and many of you are already doing that you have information about um, performance measures what else can we be doing in terms of signal operations to take things to the next level to actually make things easier for you um you know you mentioned alerts Sabir, when there's a major change not you don't want to alert every time you know uh you know the arrivals on red are slightly off you want it for major changes so that's important um what else can we be doing what about when there's an an incident that affects your your arterials. How can we help in terms of signal operations when there's an incident? Um, is something like a, you know, a flush plan or some sort of um, synchronization specific right. for incidents? Is that something that you would be interested in or, or are using now uh, that we can improve upon? This is a bit again. I think, yeah, I think it's like a, a, a one step lower than the, uh, the ICM. You know, right. on the mm -hmm. corridor itself, you know, where you actually have plans to, in case, you know, I mean, I don't know, through modeling, but it probably becomes a little bit too much. But yeah. if there's an incident that you move to a certain plan to flush it out, you mm -hmm. know, in a, you know, in a different way, or, or it, it will have a CMS signs that will come out and says, hey, you know, uh, there is an accident at this location, so you may want to, you know, use a different route. You know, so mm -hmm. that's, uh, I think that's very, uh, and, and the CMS signs, I, I mean, at least my experience of it, it really does attract a lot of attention from the driver, especially mm -hmm. at the lower speed at the local level, you know, so it, it can work and it can be integrated. The other thing mm -hmm. I really wanted to say is that if we do, let's say, a plan or do some parameters of the signals, 
you really want it to be embedded in the signal system mm -hmm. in a way that you don't want, let's say, political influence of changing it the way at the rim of the uh, the way mm -hmm. they want to change it. So whatever you do, I mean, uh, whatever. I mean, let's say for some reason you say, I'm going to extend the green time on this corridor in this direction when, when incident uh, A happens from 30 seconds to 50 seconds. That you want to make sure that, I don't know, even if there is complaint, you really want to only adjust it to fine tune it, but not just take it out. Because mm -hmm. you, you put the plan in and you go away, Sendai doesn't have much influence on the timing of the signals. The local agency can go and do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's, that's, I think, to me, is an important that it becomes embedded in the traffic signal system itself. That there that's isn't a good point. A, yeah. What about an agreement between adjacent agencies that say, this is what we agreed to in terms of signal operations. If you choose to change it, you know, we need to go back and talk together to understand the impact for everyone else. Is that something that people are open to having an agreement on how the signals should operate along a multi-agency corridor? Uh, you know, some of you have worked on yeah. the I-15, so you have yeah. something similar, but um, there are other other uh, certainly instances where that yeah. could be applicable. I think it would be a, a good idea if the local agency try understand well what they are getting into. Mm -hmm. Meaning uh, they have in-house, whether consultant or their staff, understand what they are getting with the signal timing. Because they may not really get a sense of it. And they sign that MOU. And if things change in their local environment, they may change it. And they go, okay, right. well, we are responsible for the timing. We need to change it without understanding the bigger picture impact. Mm -hmm. and that's a, and no, but it does, a, it does, you know, I guess, force the agency to obey by the rules, mm -hmm. you know, but the, they need it. But both parties, I know you, Sandeg, and with the consultant, you guys understand it, the part that you want to achieve, but the local agency understand very well what this is mean to them. What are they giving up? What are they getting in return? And that's mm -hmm. really important. Right. And certainly I'm not saying that Sandag or I are going to come and tell you what the signals need to be, but I together know. collectively yes. need to work on that. But I'm, I'm curious, any other perspectives on signal operations in a multi-agency environment? This is Sam Hassan in City Vista. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, from a kind of broader perspective where Sandag can come in, and this might be for the future, is... Uh, where all, you know, the, I guess the arterials in the county are assessed and, um, you know, potential, I guess, scenarios of uh, incidents, uh, whether it's, you know, just an accident on an evening, you know, commuter uh, rush hour or maybe a bigger incident like a fire or something like that and developing all those scenarios and uh, sort of, you know, facilitating that assessment for all the local agencies that, Probably would be difficult for all of them to get together, but then Sanda could be that, you know, could be that, I guess, the leader of something like that, and then getting into the technical aspects of maybe drawing up, you know, these agreements for, you know, different scenarios of um, potential incidents and then how, um, you know, that can be dealt with. So I think, yeah, Sanda could play a role in that. I, I see it kind of a maybe not near term, maybe a medium term. Because I mm -hmm. think there's also still some infrastructure needs in the, in the region. You know, different cities are at different levels as far as uh, communications to their signals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what controllers they're using for uh, their signal infrastructure. So there's still, I think, that need that you know that needs to be addressed before kind of even moving into a regional plan. Right. So that that's mm -hmm. kind of my take on it. That's true. The devil is in the details and certainly communication, both uh, oral communication between people, but also the physical communication connecting signals is something that, that's important. Uh, Anyone this, else? It, yeah, this is Hamid. Uh, I'm all for the um, uh, multi-agency coordination and all that, and we must do that where we are missing and where we have it, we have to improve upon it. One other thing I would like to bring up and it goes back to the issue of safety at these smart intersections. Mm -hmm is, um, for example, in Oceanside, I don't know about the other cities in the area, uh, in Oceanside, uh, we have 159 signals. 
And on a very good day when there's no fog and the sun is shining at the right angle and all that, I'll be lucky if I have bicycle detection, maybe at yeah. 10 or 15 percent mm -hmm. of the intersections. Uh, one of the reasons is that the maybe uh, most probably for us is a lack of funding uh, to mm -hmm. do bicycle detection where we have and maybe go to a newer technology where we have been using the older technologies. Uh, we were facing, um, all cities in California were facing the same challenges when we went to the um, pedestrian countdown, which is a very important safety feature at Smart Intersection. And for example, we received a, a grant, a grant uh, that we are now doing a pedestrian countdown at all our intersections. It will be good if we identify ways to improve uh, bicycle detection, bicycle timing, um, as we are um, promoting intermodalism and people using bicycle and all that, I can go out there and um, advocate with straight face people saying, use your bicycle, uh, but you're not going to get detected at traffic signal. Uh, so we, we, if it's good if we identify a new technology and um, new funding opportunities to do with bicycle detection what we did with the pedestrian countdown signals. This is a Sam City Vista. Uh, just to, Hamid reminded me actually of technology as well as being a challenge. So in addition to the just the basic infrastructure that, um, you know, as I mentioned, different cities maybe at different levels just to connect to the traffic signals, communicate with them. Technology in, in the traffic, uh, you know, um, uh, world really is a lot of times is not um, as you know what it's built to be. So, uh, for example, video detection. I've uh, had quite a bit of experience with that, with different brands, you know, current technology that it just really doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. So we used it on a limited basis as it, as it is, you know, um, basically private driveways where we don't want to do the loops in the ground. And I've actually started to take out the video detection just because of, you know, none of, it, none of the stuff that's out there really is working very well. Mm -hmm. um, adaptive traffic control, what is known as adaptive traffic control, which is uh, where your um, system adjusts the time in, to the conditions. That's another thing that's, um, you know, always is promoted as the solution to uh, congestion and, uh, you know, smart mm -hmm. traffic signals. And, and it really is not that. So there needs to be a lot of caution about all the technologies that, that's out there that really may not be uh, performing in real life as it's as advertised. That's a good point. I think what you're, you have two points really is the, the performance of it is not exactly you're kind of been sold a bill of goods, but also there is some to some extent where people assume that they find a technology and look for a, a place to put it, whether the needs dictate that that technology was appropriate or not. So that's what we're trying to do with the concept of operations is look at the strategies without specifying the technology. I think those are very good points because you have to maintain this stuff at the end of the day. And if you're not maintaining it, it's not going to do what it's supposed to be doing. So you want to make sure that what you have is what you need. Yeah, that was all good discussion. Uh, but for the sake of time, I think we need to move forward with, okay. uh, with this Thank item. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be we'll following up with the survey. Please reach out to Ellison or Alex or I if you have any questions once you receive it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alex and Alyssa. So we'll move on to item number five, the Regional Electric Vehicle Charter Rebate Program, the Cal EVIP San Diego County Incentive Project by Susan Friedman of Sendak. Go ahead. Great, thank you very much, Chair. And I think Ellison is gonna pull up my slides uh, and has them. So first wanna say thanks for having me, everybody. Uh, I'm not sure if some of you may have heard this already. Uh, we are making the rounds to make sure everybody knows about this new charger infrastructure program that we're launching on October 27th, so in about two weeks. Uh, and it's going to be a first come first serve rebate program for public and workplace chargers. And that includes chargers uh, at public agency sites like civic centers, libraries, uh, police stations and things like that. Uh, so next slide, please. A little bit about the program. Uh, first, oh, next slide, please. There we go. Um, just real quickly about why Sandag is doing this and working on an infrastructure program. 
Uh, from our 2015 regional plan, this was one of the greenhouse gas reduction measures in both our sustainable community strategy as well as in the plan's environmental impact report. Uh, so uh, the task was to launch a program in 2020 uh, in greenhouse gas emissions like the pie chart on the right hand side. This is from the 2015 regional plan, very simplified, but basically about half of our emissions come from transportation. And so things we can do in the uh, transportation electrification field do a lot for reducing our emissions as well as uh, improving local air quality. Uh, that one is not my slide, that's something else, but next slide, please. Uh, one before that, Ellison, that moved too quick. No, we're still going forward, but I can speak to this with, I know these slides too well. I'll say that this is a partnership that we're doing called Cali VIP. It's in conjunction with the California Energy Commission uh, and the Center for Sustainable Energy. And it's about 22, yes, Stop right there. <laughs> it's about $22 million uh, that we have as a three-year budget. And the breakdown is in the blue on the right, which shows Sandex putting in about one and a half million dollars a year. The Air Pollution Control District is contributing about half a million dollars a year. And those are both for level two chargers, which are the ones that are in the Sandag office place and are very common in workplaces or anywhere that somebody's gonna park for two or more hours. And then the middle one on the, on the right is the Energy Commission's contribution. They're putting in almost $16 million for DC fast charging infrastructure. Uh, and that's for like your quick charge, like spend less than 30 minutes to get a fill up. So they're very popular for uh, your Uber and Lyft drivers and other TNCs, as well as people that are doing longer travel that need to just make a quick stop and continue to get back on the road to finish their trip. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is the project. The website just launched on October 27th, two months ahead of the actual applications being accepted on October 27th. On that website, which is Cali VIP, San Diego County Incentive Project, it has some very um, simple understand information about rebate levels, what sites are eligible, how to participate, the different types of equipment that's eligible and drop down lists, as well as even if you're not sure about a contractor to use, there's some uh, Cali VIP Connect services in there. Uh, but it's a first come first serve rebate program. Again, it's for public workplace and multifamily sites. The key with what we are funding are shared infrastructure. So it's nobody's dedicated private charging station. It's gotta be, we want the more the merrier, the more people using it, the better. Uh, and in terms of that almost $22 million budget, what that means in terms of infrastructure is that we expect it should fund about 1,100 new level two charging connectors in the region and 250 fast chargers. And I'm saying charging connectors for level two because some uh, chargers you see have two connectors can hook up to two cars at once. Others are singles like in the Sandag garage. And so we count based on how many connectors. So you could either have five singles or 10, or excuse me, five doubles or 10 singles um, rebated through this program. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this gives you an idea of what types of sites are eligible. So for level two charging sites, again, it can be uh, the common areas or visitor spaces of multi-unit dwellings. K through 12 schools, colleges, hospitals, public agencies, on tribal lands, military bases, curbside uh, applications as well. On the fast chargers, there are some more eligibility restrictions here because uh, it's a large rebate amount. And so the state is requiring that these sites for a rebate are open every day of the year, 24 hours a day. And so these can be your shopping centers, grocery stores, uh, again, certain public agency sites, hospitals, libraries, casinos, and mobility hubs are another one. So next slide, please. Uh, something I did wanna point out is that for our region, uh, the APCD and SANDAG worked diligently with the Energy Commission to promote higher incentives for installations in communities of concern. 
When we look at, and I don't know if a map here today, but you can see one in the attachment, which was a Sandag info bit in the report, kind of shows the spread of where chargers, public chargers are right now in the region. You see a lot of them are not located in the purple areas in our county. And these purple areas show in the light purple, the low income communities, and in the darker purple, disadvantaged communities. And then with the slashes shows the combination of both low income and disadvantage. And what we're gonna do, what we're doing is offering a higher incentive amount for both the level two and the fast chargers here, uh, as well as additional technical assistance for participants that are interested in putting a charging station or, or more charging stations on their properties in these communities. Uh, we've got the Center for Sustainable Energy available to do some more intermediate and complex uh, site assessments with them to help them figure out what the cost would be and if the implications and what maybe their best options are. In terms of the links that are, I've included where, that where it says disadvantaged communities highlighted as well as a map, you can click on these links and it'll take you to the Air Resources Board website for communities of concern. And you can enter in a physical address and then that will pop up and let you know whether that address qualifies as a state designated low income or disadvantaged community. So it's a way to quickly know whether you qualify for the higher incentives. Next slide, please. So these will be talking about our, um, the incentive amounts. Next slide, please. For the level two chargers, uh, these are those more common chargers everywhere and are popular at homes. The base amount is $4,500. Then if it's a multi-unit dwelling the installation's going into, uh, people are eligible for an additional $1,000 per connector. And for disadvantaged and low-income communities, an additional $500. So you potentially can qualify for up to $6,000 per level two connector. The reason for the higher incentives is that uh, for multi-unit dwellings, the data has shown that it is much more expensive to get chargers installed in these types of, in these place types. And then also, since we want to promote more charging infrastructure in underserved communities, we have the higher incentive uh, for communities of concern as well. Next slide, please. On the fast charging rebates, this one is a little different. There's the standard fast charger that are kind of out there everywhere. I'm not talking about the Tesla chargers, but um, the Blink chargers and EVgo ones, a lot of those were at this 50 kilowatt to under 100 kilowatt power level, and that rebates at $50,000. And then the Energy Commission wants to put their money to more future proofing of uh, the next generation of fast chargers. And so there's a lot of equipment that's out there that, that is a, a higher power draw, which means people can charge their vehicles a lot faster. Uh, and so the 100 kilowatt or above chargers get an actual extra $20,000 uh, kick up or adder. So $70,000 base there. For disadvantaged and low income communities, it's a $10,000 adder for both types. I'll say another reason for this, um, the higher incentive with the 100 kilowatt and higher chargers we want these faster charges as more and more battery electric vehicles get out on the market and have bigger batteries. It means that it will take them longer to charge. And so by putting in these faster chargers, we're circumventing the problem of um, people staying in the spots too long and can encourage more people having access to them. So next slide, please. So just to highlight a few additional resources that are happening. Uh, we have an EV expert, which uh, is available to everyone to call if you have questions on, is my site eligible or I want to do these kinds of things? Like you can reach out to the link I've provided there for technical assistance. And somebody from the Center for Sustainable Energy will get back to you shortly on that. Then we're also holding a couple technical workshops. One is on workforce development. Uh, and that is for electricians and electrical contractors to learn more about a training certification called the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program. That's going to be next week on the 22nd. Uh, and that's going to kind of cue electricians up for some future trainings that are going to be requirements for EV charger installations in about a year and a half. Uh, so we want to build up the workforce training on that. And then for permit streamlining, 
Uh, this is targeting to all local governments, uh, the code officials, permit plan check folks, the webinar for authorities having jurisdiction on um, what to expect with uh, addressing charger permit applications. Because we expect from this program that there's going to be a lot more folks that are applying for permits at each local agency and to provide a refresher on what those tools are that are available. And I'll, I'll say a couple extra because we have the speakers lined up for this now. We've got both the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, which led the charge for a streamlining permit streamlining guidebook for the state and targeting to help out local jurisdictions. We also have the Division of State Architects is going to be on the webinar. And they are the, um, this woman Ida is the expert in the state on how to address accessibility and ADA requirements and issues and considerations in terms of EV charger installations. So it should be a really good webinar and those links are to the registration sites for that. Uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, and then just some final thoughts on this. I, I think, you know, I wanted to bring this up to Santec and Allison asked me because uh, I know there's a lot of talk even on the future with connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles and with the next OS and, and really these electric vehicles are going to be the ones that are more equipped with that next generation communications technology. So we're likely going to see, you know, a lot of trials in the connected to AV through electric vehicles. And this program is one of those first steps in providing funding for much needed infrastructure in the region. The whole state needs a lot more infrastructure, uh, but this is a mechanism to get more uh, in the ground here. Uh, and then in the staff report that's in your agenda packet, there's also links to the website for how to apply and link to uh, our webinar that was on October 6th with the state that walked through, uh, it was a two hour webinar on how does someone apply. Um, but you can still always reach out to the information we've got here as well to get those answers. So I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hi, Susan. This is Hamid. Uh, I think about three years ago, there was a piece of legislation asking um, the state to prepare a statewide master plan of the charging stations. Uh, to do a need assessment, audit of existing, identify future needs, and develop suggestions for locations. Do you, did you follow that? Did you, do you know if they're doing that now? Yeah, I think you're talking about what became, it's called EVI Pro, but it was an EV infrastructure projection tool. And the Energy Commission partnered with the National Renewable Energy Lab to create it. And we used that tool as a basis. It, it identified what the needs were, um, minimum needs for workplace, multi-unit dwellings, and public EV chargers by county in the state. And so we've been using that tool as a base, and that's what uh, the Energy Commission used to identify what their funding level would be for our region. Um, so we're getting a lot more money than some other regions because we have a greater need there. But, and yeah, we're continuing to use that and, the, and trying to figure out now with the governor's latest executive order, which um, I didn't mention at the start, but uh, it's calling for only uh, the sale of only new zero emission vehicles, passenger vehicles by 2035, so no more internal combustion engine vehicles, and by 2045 for buses and trucks, only zero emission vehicles to be sold in California. There's still going to be some steps with the Air Resources Board and the legislature for that to happen, but we're trying to think ahead to not just this EVI Pro tool, but how do we, you know, plan and ready the region for that bigger, bigger um, task. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Susan, thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, I'm with the County of San Diego and it really is our responsibility as a county traffic engineer and for that matter of fact the whole department that I am with is really is the public roadways. If you ask to put in, in you know in a, a charger within a public facility let's say the Civic Center or a library or a park that will be outside my responsibility but so for that question I wanted to ask is that I saw on the uh, the fast charging or the, is the level one or the level three? How do they call it? 
Um, right. Unofficially, it's level three. Level three, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so and you had the list and you, one of them down, it goes and says curbside. So you want to say something? Oh, no, I'll let, I'm sorry. I, I'll, you finish and then I'll. <laughs> okay. So, so in, in, in looking at curbside, I am assuming that this is for a car that parks on the public street on the curbside, there is a, there is a chargers that they can use that parking, that public parking space to charge their car at that location. Now, if that is true, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I want you to make, make sure that my, if that is true, uh, who maintains that uh, facility? And uh, yeah, and uh, right, I think it's more the maintenance of the facility. Is that an additional maintenance element of the roadway that I have to worry about? Oh, that's a good question. Generally, we have like it caveated with a lot of footnotes and I tried to move like clear out a lot of extra writing in there. So with the curbside options, yeah, it says um, that must be determined with the local jurisdiction before applying because the city or county, you know, whoever is responsible for that right away must be saying it's usually that this a city that's applying then and saying we want to put it in curbside uh, so but regardless even if it's maybe a business and their street parking and so they want to work with the city and work something out but yeah that's got to get figured out ahead of time because right. curbside is very special it's the first year they're allowing curbside right. so they're still trying to work it out but it, it's something that would be with the authority having jurisdiction for that area but i'll yeah. say Oh, um, the incentive amount is priced at a point where, um, like you could buy the charger for that amount of money, but, um, or work out a deal with folks, but you're able to put in some of your, like if it's a three year warranty or, or with the fast chargers, you need to add in the five year warranty can be covered by the incentive amount for the level two is a two year warranty for the incentive amount. Uh, but we're hopeful that by covering a lot of this initial capital expense, that makes it easier for covering the ongoing operations and maintenance, uh, which is something that is up to the individual host with um, whichever EV charger service provider they work with, because there's lots of different deals out there. So it could be that you're not paying for it and you do something else or, or they want to advertise, but yeah. it's, uh, there's a lot of different business models. So I can't speak directly other than we're hoping that initial investment helps make it easier for the ongoing kind of O&M that may come up. Yeah. So you, for us uh, as the public agency, especially the county, I mean, you know, I'm with the county and if we, it really is, where are you put, what type of street you're putting in it? And if you're putting in it, maybe it's a convenient place, but it could be a higher speed roadway. We have to worry about the liability and is that, new fixed object within what we call recovery zone or not. So there is a lot of other issues that could be raised. Now, if you're talking about downtown, it's a different story. Everybody's driving 20 or 25 miles per hour. It's not a big deal. But if you put it in somewhere where the speed is 45 on a major roadway, but next to a shopping center, for example, we have to worry about it because that's an additional potential liability for us. If somebody hits it, what do we do? Who's responsible and all that stuff. So I think those, but I really truly see the, a great potential for it because that land is there. That parking that is on street parking is always there. Part of the roadway that you don't have to de make a deal with the shopping center to take an additional parking out of them, but it's right there for it. But there are a lot of uh, things that needs to work. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zabir. And uh, we do have to move on. And I'm sure uh, Susan can answer all your questions. If you have any, you know, we can contact her directly. Uh, oh, Susan, one, one last thing. Can you send the, the um, presentation to the uh, committee members? It's, it's very informative. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Ellison, I think he's got it, so he can okay. send that out to everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank we you very much. Share, we will share the slides in PDF format uh, with the group. Uh, Chair, uh, we actually need to go back to the previous item um, and ask for public comment. Which right. item? Number four? Uh, yeah, we kind of moved ahead too quickly. Uh, I believe there was a hand raised. If the person who had their hand raised on the previous items would like to speak, uh, either through chat or raise your hand um, if you're an attendee. 
Uh, did you see a hand raised? Uh, I, Alex saw the hand. So okay. If okay. not, are, are there any public? I, this oh. is Maureen. I had my hand raised, but the discussion covered most of the things I was thinking about. I was just going to contribute. There's nothing I need to say right now. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Maureen. Sure. Couldn't, okay. I didn't catch that in time. Um, any, any public comment on um, Cal EVIP before we move on? Okay, seeing none. So we'll move on to the next item, number six, the 2021 Performance Management Rule 1 Safety Target Setting by SANDAC staff, Sam Sanford. Go for it. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sam Sanford. Thank you, Chair, for introducing me. I believe you should be able to see my screen now and hear me all right? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so we're here, we're back. Uh, this is the fourth annual target setting for regional safety performance targets. Uh, so we started this back in around 2017, setting the first round for the calendar year 2018. And now we're back today to set or to discuss the setting for the 2021 regional safety performance targets. So to provide a little bit of background, let me get my slides to advance. There we go. Um, back in 2016, 2017, Federal Highway Administration started developing several rulemakings in support of MAP21 and FAST Act requirements. And so these are all about transportation performance management. So there's three in general. The first one covers fatalities and serious road or fatalities and serious injuries on all public roads. And that's the one we're gonna be discussing today. There were two others, uh, the second one, looking at infrastructure condition, particularly pavement and bridge condition. And the third one was more on system performance, looking at reliability, congestion, mode share, and then emission reductions. So focusing on that first one of fatalities and serious injuries, in that rulemaking, Federal Highway developed five performance measures. So there's the number and rate of fatalities, and rate for this is based on 100 million vehicle miles traveled. There's the number and rate of serious injuries. Again, the rate is also by 100 million uh, VMT. And then the fifth one on the list here is the number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. So that's actually a combined measure where it looks at uh, pedestrians and cyclists for both the fatality and serious injury numbers. Now the way the process works is first Caltrans sets up targets and they work with the Office of Traffic Safety and the governor's office to establish the first three uh, targets and those have to be the same between Caltrans and, and OTS, Office of Traffic Safety. And then they establish the, the final two. They then share those targets with all the MPOs across the state and the MPOs have the option of either supporting the statewide targets or developing their own targets. And with developing their own targets, they also need to have some um, actions ready in order to support the development of those targets or the accomplishment of those targets. So for the statewide or for the MPOs, we'd be required to set those targets or notify Caltrans of our intentions by February 28th. So the reporting function is Sandag lets Caltrans know, you know we're either supporting this statewide targets or we're, we're gonna develop our own and go our own way. And then Caltrans actually reports targets to Federal Highway Administration. So they're ultimately the ones that report. Sandag does not report directly to Federal Highway on the target setting. As far as implications, uh, there is some HSIP funding flexibility that can be affected for some states if the targets are not met. Uh, in California in particular, this has not been an issue. Essentially, the implication comes in that uh, state DOTs would not be eligible to flex some of their HSIP into other pots or into other uh, programs, but Caltrans has not been in the habit of doing that, historically has not done that, so it's, that stick is not actually um, pertinent to this conversation. But there is this fourth bullet where states must submit an annual implementation plan if the targets are not met. So that is an additional plan requirement that comes 
with uh, not meeting significant progress on targets. And again, these targets are set annually on the calendar year. So we are sitting now in 2020 and we are finally have results for 2018. So one of the challenges working with safety data, as I'm sure everybody here knows, is there is some delay in between when incidents occur, data is collected, summarized, and then shared back out. There's usually about a two year delay in getting those uh, aggregated values shared to uh, jurisdictions and across the state and across the nation. So earlier this year, Federal Highway Administration was able to look at the 2018 targets, the first year of target setting, and the 2018 observed data, and they found that California did not make significant progress. In order to make significant progress, they either have to meet the targets or be better than the targets or better than the baseline for the year prior for at least four out of the five measures. And what the data show that for 2018, that California did not meet that threshold for fatality rate, serious injury rate, and number of serious injuries. So as a result, those, uh, as a, on the previous slide, I mentioned there was two uh, implications, one being HSIP funding that does not affect California, and the second being an HSIP implementation plan. So Caltrans is now developing an HSIP implementation plan uh, for this year, essentially it's looking at how best to use those you know, finite HSIP dollars and to document how they're gonna go about doing that process. Now getting to the 2021 statewide safety targets. What Caltrans followed for setting these targets is a trend-based approach. And they have looked, there's different approaches that state DOTs can take. They can take an aspirational, you know, where do they want to be by a certain year. They can do trend-based. They can do it based on what projects are programmed for that year. For this iteration, they went for trend-based. For fatalities, they looked at the change between 2017 and 2018 observed data, found that change, that percent change, and then applied it. So for the number of fatalities, we can see the number the statewide number for the five-year rolling average, and then the percent reduction that Caltrans is expecting, which is 2.9%. That was approximately the change they saw between calendar years 2017 and 2018. In addition to the trend information, they also take into consideration what projects are being programmed that, can, that has some influence on it, and then also uh, external forces. You know, it might be based on the economy, VMT, how much people will be traveling. They also take that kind of, that information into consideration. So for targets relating to fatality values, there's a reduction of 2.9%. For targets related to serious injury, there's a reduction in 1.3%. And then for the non-motorized combined target, it's, uh, kind of prorated with the approach of having 2.9% for fatalities and 1.9% or 1.3% reduction for serious injuries. Now the next several slides go into charts of how the statewide numbers compare to the San Diego region on average and kind of gives us a little bit of context of how we're doing uh, in our region. So starting with fatalities and the color system will, will follow through for all these charts. There's, there's quite a few charts, but everything in blue is, is related to the state, to Caltrans. And this is for all public roads. And everything in orange is for the San Diego County area. So all the cities and, and the, the county, all the public roads within our region. The green diamonds are the past targets. And then there is a green square, which is the uh, proposed 2021 statewide target. So looking at this with just fatalities, it's very, it's challenging to compare how San Diego region is doing in these orange uh, hues down at the bottom relative to the statewide, which is significantly larger. So one of the approaches we do to try and better understand how our region is doing relative to the state is look at this, the same statistics based on population. On average, uh, the San Diego region is about 8.4% of the state population. And then if I advance one slide, this black line is 
the San Diego region's population relative to the states. That's about 8.4%. And then in the orange, the dark orange is the annual fatality numbers that we have had in San Diego region. And then the lighter orange is the five-year rolling average, which is what the uh, rule is based on. And you can see from this chart that our region is doing relatively well, considering our population is 8.4%, but our fatality numbers based on uh, population is, is much lower. So this is just one illustrative way to better understand how our region is doing compared to the statewide numbers. Moving on to the second performance measure, which is fatalities by VMT. Since this measure is already normalized by vehicle miles traveled, it's easier to compare. And we can see again, the statewide values are in blue, the San Diego regional values are in orange, and then the targets are in green. Here we have that the San Diego region is performing relatively well compared to the statewide values when normalized for VMT. And we can see the targets off for these future years. You'll notice there are gaps since we do not have data for 2019 or 2020, yet we're still required to set targets for 2021. Looking at serious injuries, so this is the number of serious injuries. Uh, again, we have the challenge of, of understanding the difference between these because it's not normalized, but you can tell that the targets for 2018, uh, this is one of the areas where the state did not meet targets because um, the observed values were exceeded the target considerably. 2019 data is preliminary, but it is expected to be higher than the target as well. So if we look at the relative population in San Diego region, keeping that at that approximate 8.4%, and then we have the uh, percent of serious injury, serious injuries relative to that population. Again, the San Diego region is doing relatively well. The dark orange again is the annual, and the lighter orange is the five-year rolling average. Just a few more here. We have serious injury rate by VMT. So again, this one's already normalized, so it's easier to see the difference between the state in blue and the San Diego region in orange. Uh, again, San Diego region is performing well relative to the state. And again, this was one of the areas where the state did not meet the target where the observed serious injury rate exceeded the target for 2018. The target for 2021 is, is higher than it was in, in previous rounds. For non-motorized, so this is bicyclists and pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, we can see here, again, it's a little challenging to tell the difference between how the San Diego region is doing in orange relative to the state in blue, but we can see the target for 2021 uh, is, is slightly higher than it was for 2020. Looking at this relative to population, um, on an annual level, looking at the orange line, we have had one instance back in 2014 where our percent of this type of fatality and injury or this, this total number of fatality and injury eclipsed our percent of population. But for all the other years, it has been lower and the five-year rolling average is lower as well. So for setting the target for 2021, this is our fourth round. They're set annually. And with the past three rounds, SANDAG has elected to support the statewide target. And part of the reason for that is that the region is doing relatively well when you look at the data normalized for either VMT or for population. Uh, so that has been kind of what we've been looking at for the past three rounds. And now we, as we're going through this process, we want to see if there are any other pieces of information we should bring into this conversation, this discussion, um, if there's a change or if we are comfortable continuing with this process. A couple more and then I, I see there might be a comment or two or a question. So if SANDAG supports the statewide target, then we do not need to set a numeric target. We just provide documentation to Caltrans saying we will support them. As far as what SANDAG does need to do, 
we do need to highlight uh, essentially in the regional plan, so the forthcoming 2021 regional plan, what those targets are, and also how we've been doing progress to targets. And then in the RTIP, we identify projects that support the target. So if, if you go into Project Track and you're supporting, uh, putting in that information about what projects your agency is, is putting into 2021 RTIP, there is a section on transportation performance management where we ask, is this project safety related? Uh, how much is this um, of the total project cost is safety? And we tally that kind of information sum it up into charts and tables in our tip to demonstrate that we're supporting the statewide target. If, let's see, um, if the SANDAG elects to make their own targets, then we have to go through a little bit more of a process of what those targets are, how we went about achieving, uh, developing those targets, and what are our steps to help achieve those targets. As far as next steps, we're going to continue going through to the working groups and getting uh, input through the fall and winter, and then starting with the policy advisory committees this winter. And by February 28th, we need to inform Caltrans of uh, our approach. And then as I mentioned before, we'll be including a summary of projects that support the safety targets in the 2021 RTIP, and then also the targets themselves and our progress to targets in the 2021 regional plan. So that's what I have for right now. I believe I saw a hand up as I was going through this. But I Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Let's limit question just one, please. Go ahead. Uh, oh, go ahead. You, you're asking. I am the one. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, I mean, uh, it really is. Uh, not only I have a question. I have a lot of things to talk about this program. So. Uh, I really think that this one here, it's the core of what we do as a traffic engineer. So it almost should be an item on its own in Santex so we can discuss. Because I think the way we're doing it is completely uh, not right. And we will never achieve our goals because we don't have follow-up. I can tell you that some of the ISHSIP programs that the grant has awarded, you go back and look at the accident afterward and some of them, the accident went up because the mitigation that we did wasn't really the proper mitigation for that facility. So, so I think it's really as is a, is a, is a, is a critical that we do the follow-up. So question do I have? I mean, I really have a lot of questions. So I let the other people talk and I truly, Allison, I really want you to bring this back uh, or chair, I want you to bring this back or I'll be happy to just myself and meet with Sandag staff and talk about it. Because this is this is so critical in my mind to us, and uh, you know, to to as a traffic engineer, we really need to reduce the fatalities on the roadway. There is nothing else we do in this life more important than making a safe roadway for our users, for the public, whether the vulnerable that are walking, biking, or driving. So, so I do have a lot of questions. So, but I leave it to others to ask questions. Right. I, I think you, this is going to take a lot more time. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I don't mind to bring it back at all <coughs> if Sandak's okay with that. I, we are absolutely okay with that. Um, this was, as much as this was a discussion item, I, we can certainly, um, I don't think there's anything you need from the group at this very moment, correct? Correct. Um, but we will certainly um, put this back on and Sam, if likely we could bring you back and do more of a round table, but have you on as a, as a panelist, um, yeah. let's discuss that. And um, Xavier, why don't we uh, talk about your uh, comments and questions offline? And sure. uh, but, uh, Vice Chair, if we want, we can put this back on the agenda and have a more open discussion about this. Again, this is within the framework of a federal performance management uh, rulemaking. But uh, you know, I, I understand um, your questions and concerns and re your reactions, Zubir. Um, but we are bringing this to Santec within that framework. Uh, but I, I believe you know, traffic safety is obviously something that we all uh, care about within this uh, particular working group. And uh, we, so we can put this back on and bring this uh, agenda item 
um, we can detangle it or de take it apart a little bit more and and you know address other concerns that the group has. I know we're 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 stretched for time right now, and I want to make sure that Caltrans gives uh, gives their report as well. So, um, Vice Chair, I'll give the okay. floor back to you. Sounds good. Thanks, Allison and Sam. Thank well, you. Item number seven, Caltrans updates. Uh, not sure I saw Caltrans. Uh, do I have a Caltrans rep? Yes, we do. Uh, yes, that, that will be me. Uh, okay. Steve Capuno, uh, District 11 local assistance. Yes. Go ahead. So, um, uh, Allison, do you have the slides or do you want me? I, I was not given any slides. If you would please just give us a high level overview of um, what was in the uh, written report that the agenda members do have? Sure, I, I think, uh, yeah, some of you have, uh, I think a lot of you have, have the handout for this, so that was sent to you maybe, as, as it was sent to me uh, previously. But uh, going through all your uh, handouts in there, um, so uh, uh, first of all, if there's any questions, uh, just like, I guess in the interest of time, just uh, forward them to Allison and uh, pretty much you can forward it to us and we'll get back to you on that. So uh, first item, um, first of all, um, we'll go through a few items and um, just go from there. So the first item will be for inactive projects. So um, for the agencies, uh, I, I think you know on a regular basis, we do send uh, the inactive projects, uh, future projects list. So you guys can you know, submit your um, invoices on time you know, to uh, avoid the obligation so for those um, projects that are inactive, uh, November 20, 2020 is your deadline to submit. So you don't, you know, so you'll be on time. And uh, so next item will be the HIP program, cycle 10, call for projects. Um, last May, there's been a cycle 10 call for projects for HIP. And the deadline uh, now is coming up fast. Although it says uh, here October 19, 2020, uh, the new deadline, it's been extended to November 2, November 2nd, 2020. So uh, all of what I'm saying here um, are resources. Uh, you can always look up at the local assistance uh, website, you know, for Caltrans pretty much. What we have here, it's pretty much, um, most of it is all, is all there. Uh, next item will be your request for authorizations. Of course, we always remind you to submit as early as possible. Because um, uh, in recent years, you know, uh, obligation authorities has been, you know, pretty much, uh, it dwindles faster than pretty much uh, like in the previous years. So for the fiscal year 20, uh, 2020, um, we have, uh, we're saying January the 29th will be your, um, deadline to submit your RFAs. So, and then the next item will be uh, the new program. This is a new federal lands access program. As far as I know, uh, Caltrans, uh, decent district, like we never had any of this project. So there is a couple of handouts for that that gives you an overview uh, of this FLAP uh, project. So, and the brochure is also available online. And I think the website is listed, you know, on your, on the handouts. So, um, on the handouts, I think I'll skip the next three items and uh, proceed with the CTC uh, preparation schedule. So as, uh, as a guideline, uh, we, we do um, ask the agencies to submit, you know, Give them, give us like a two month, uh, you know, leeway, you know, for uh, CTC allocation requests, and um, so uh, for for uh, the January um, CTC meeting, uh, I think it was scheduled uh, January twenty seven, twenty eight. The deadline to submit your allocation uh, request to district would be, uh, at least we're setting it on November 25th. Uh, why is that? Because uh, I think the Thanksgiving holidays. So we encourage you to submit before that, which is no later than uh, November 25th. So let's see. 
other items. Uh, okay, one other item is the local roadway safety plan. Uh, we're bringing this up because uh, for the HSIP uh, cycle 11, it will be uh, mandatory to have an LRSP. So before you can uh, apply for an HSIP. So the HSIP cycle 11 will be, uh, I think it's saying here it's around uh, April 2022. So that will probably be the time when they call out for projects again. So just uh, please take note of that. And um, also um, for the federal aid series recordings, which is uh, available for our uh, project contract administration. So these are good uh, resources uh, for us and also the local agencies. So on your handouts, the link should be uh, listed there. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, this is essential so you can, you know, pretty much get an overall background of uh, procedures and, you know, um, everything, you know, necessary that you might need, you know, in order for your projects to uh, get funded. And uh, next item will be uh, the quality assurance program. So there are a couple of renewals due for 2021. Uh, I believe that will be for uh, the city of San Diego and Sandag. So if they're planning, to, of course, to uh, submit, you know, for uh, funding for federal projects, of course, they need to update that. And uh, the same goes uh, for the city of Poway and uh, Solana Beach. If they are planning to apply for federal funding, uh, they will need to have a QAP uh, on file. So let's see. I will skip through some of these items and probably go to uh, this item. Okay, subsidized classes for uh, local agencies. Uh, they have it online. So the California uh, Local Assistance uh, Assistance Program, um, LTAP, so we call it LTAP. Uh, I think this we sent to the local agencies um, and uh, we, we send this as a notice to them so they can uh, avail of these uh, training programs. So on your handouts, that would be uh, listed there and uh, you can uh, register for these. And if you have any further questions on you know, registering for these uh, uh, classes, uh, you can always contact uh, our, our resource person at District 11, which is uh, Alma, Alma Sanchez. So she, she, you know, with regards to questions about training, you can always uh, contact her. So I think that is uh, pretty much what I have on uh, for today. Uh, thank you, uh, Ellison and uh, Chair. Okay, thank you, Steve, for the update. Thank you. No, hey, Minji, I, I have a quick question if you, I know we're running out of time, uh, but for Caltrain, I have a really quick question regarding the uh, local uh, roadway safety plan that we need to prepare that uh, prerequisite for the uh, HSIP grant for the future. That's good, that's what you said. And I think that's my understanding. If the funding for that plan is a local funding, not a, a, a grant, how does Caltran follow up on the plan appropriateness that it follows the guidelines and that's what you want to meet the goals of the, uh, the HSIP? Uh, I, I think in the interest of time, I think uh, you should forward that question so we can answer that like uh, in, in okay. probably yeah, in a more detailed manner. I can do so, um, I, yeah. I think uh, that'll be better. Right. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Minty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I will do that. Yeah. Yeah. Probably more appropriate for a person who's uh, specializing in the local roadway safety plan. Yeah, we do have a uh, we we do have a resource person that coordinator for uh, LRSP in our district. So I think it's better to kind of direct that to her. Although I I do have some experience on that, but I think she is probably a better resource than I am. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Next item: CTAC meeting briefing. Uh, Mario, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just be really brief. Just uh, less than a minute. Um, the October meeting, we had uh, an update on the 2021 uh, Regional uh, Transportation Improvement Pro Program update. And that was a presentation by Sue. 
Uh, another item that was discussed is the 2021 regional plan development update on the local street and roadway network efforts. Uh, SANDAG will be uh, submitting uh, uh, a request to all the agencies to get cost of updated cost estimates and phasing information for our, our local streets and road projects. So be on the lookout for that. Um, other item that was discussed was the, the development of the regional TISMO, which was presented a little bit earlier, but uh, much shorter. Um, but just a comprehensive update on, on that project, which is a Caltrans planning grant. And Sandeg is the recipient of that grant uh, project. And the last item was uh, development of the regional intelligent transportation system architecture update. Uh, Sandeg is working on a new, uh, uh, an update of the development of the regional ITS up, update. And that's going to be coming out, rolling out the plan in February 2021. So that's it, brief. Thank you, Mario. Okay, item number nine, matters from members. For the sake of time, I think I'd like to skip this item unless you have something you just can't wait. <laughs> I have that? something, but I can wait, I can wait. Okay, thank you, <laughs> so Peter. I know you I also, always have something. <laughs> I share, uh, if I may, uh, I'm gonna share my screen real quick regarding um, our October 29th um, joint meeting. Uh, I will send this out uh, along with um, today's slides, presentation slides, but uh, as you recall, we uh, asked for you to reserve October 29th for a joint working group meeting. Um, that is set. Uh, I apologize uh, for not getting this out sooner. Um, we're asking for your time in the afternoon on the 29th if you can see my screen, our slot will be from 1 to 150, and we will have a working group meeting for Santec. It will be a Brown Act meeting, um, publicly noticed. Uh, all the working groups here will be meeting throughout the day, but because of our Zoom license, we can only have two working groups meeting at the same time. Uh, and then we ask all the working groups to get back together at, at four o'clock. So we're gonna ask for your time at, from one to 150 and from four to 5 p.m. to all get together and talk about the regional plan. So uh, again, I'll send out this grid. Uh, a bunch of you may be part of another working group so you can decide which group you wanna be part of, particularly if you wanna do CTAC instead of SANTAC, or if you wanna listen in on any of the other working groups um, and see what um, they're talking about, um, you're open, you're welcome to join those as a public member. But as, uh, as, a, as a voting member of Santec, we need you from 1 to 150, and then uh, we will reconvene all the working groups from 4 to 5. So, thank you. Thank you, Allison. Next item, upcoming agenda items. Uh, if you have any items of interest to, to the committee, please send it to Allison or Jim or myself. And our upcoming meeting in November will be scheduled for the 19th of November, if we do, uh, you know, so please uh, wait for the, uh, the notice, okay? Unless you have anything else, I cannot wait. Uh, well, this meeting will be adjourned. Thanks so much for all, for all of you for attending. Also, thank you, Sandex staff for supporting. Thank you. Thank you, Menji. Thank, thank you, you Menji. Thank, Thank you, you, Allison. Thank bye -bye. you. Thanks, Benji. Thank you. Bye-bye.